Hello everyone. Good evening. This is Dr. Sullivan back with you for another I Care for Your Brain free brain health lecture. My job is to come to you every Wednesday night at six o'clock and help give you the education and empowerment that you need for proper brain health. Tonight our focus is on sleep. Sleep is a staple of physical, mental, and brain health. If we aren't sleeping well, we are not going to think well, we're not going to feel well, we are not going to heal well. These are very important things for us to talk about. Sleep occupies over one third of our life, but scientists have really only figured out the purpose of sleep about 20, 25 years ago. Our focus tonight is on the most common but underdiagnosed sleep disorder. It affects 25 million people, but only one in four actually know that they have it. So we have to talk about the symptoms, who's at risk, and what happens when you don't treat it because it absolutely results in brain damage. It sounds dramatic, but I'm not overstating. What I care about most is that the treatment for sleep apnea is so effective. It's one of the only things that I know that I can tell my patients that actually reverses the brain damage. And so what we're talking about tonight is sleep apnea. So when we start talking about sleep, what we're really talking about is the circadian rhythm. This is the approximate 24 hour cycle that is a physiological process that is in all living things, all the way down to plants and fungi. It is generally regulated by internal cues like hormones, especially self-generated melatonin and cortisol, but it can also be triggered and therefore messed up by external cues like light, temperature, and eating. The circadian rhythm is dictated by two really simple things. When it is dark out, we are supposed to be producing melatonin to help make us sleepy, and we are supposed to be suppressing cortisol to help us not feel Feel that we have uh, something to attend to or something to uh, complete, something to do, an action to take. And when it is light out, the whole idea is that reverses and melatonin actually goes down and cortisol to help us be alert and to get through our daily tasks is supposed to rise. Now we do a fine job as human beings at fouling all that up and that is part of what we have to talk about tonight. So what is the function of sleep? Why do we sleep? It's a quite a vulnerable time really you know, ideally seven to nine hours a night when you are unconscious and um, completely, uh, you know, at, at the will of anyone in your environment, there must be a really good reason, right? Well, the major restorative functions in the body like muscle growth, tissue repair, protein synthesis, growth hormone synthesis, and release, these mostly occur when we are in deep sleep. Sleep is a biological necessity. We need it to survive. The longest recorded time that anyone has ever gone without sleep is just over 11 consecutive days. The person died after. Only after about three nights of not sleeping, people start to have sleep deprivation, and this is when things like hallucinations can start to set in. Anyone that has had a newborn child knows all about sleep deprivation. Animals who are deprived of sleep for weeks on end uh, show temperature and weight loss changes and ultimately die from things like infections. Modern neuroscientists understand that sleep is mostly for the brain and it has a lot to do with cleaning out the byproducts of being a human being and being alert and processing information and making room for new growth and optimal blood flow. So you can really think about sleep as cleanup time. It is a very, very active time for your brain. It is not a path of time. Our muscles are pretty passive, uh, but our brain is really not. So especially in the deep stages of sleep, we have a cleanup crew that basically goes around and breaks down all of the debris that is a byproduct of our cells, our neurons that's left behind from all the hard work. And we have to flush it out of our system. We have to chop it up into small enough pieces where it can either be reabsorbed or flushed out. And all of this bad stuff has to go away because we need room for new growth. So there's a constant restorative process of cleaning out what we don't need and putting back in what we need. So for example, when we're awake, brain cells have a byproduct called adenosine. And this is just something kind of like smoke coming out of a chimney, right? It is thought to be one factor as it builds up that leads us to feeling sleepy. And so as long as we're awake, this adenosine is constantly accumulating. And during sleep, the immune system in our brain 
uh, clears it out. And as a result, we can wake up and feel alert when it's working well. Um, there's a few things uh, that happen when we don't get good sleep in terms of the Sedina sign. It can build up into the neurons and then we get inflammation, which is really kind of the scientific buzzword for brain health right now is we want to be anti-inflammatory, right? We want to have our blood vessels as open as possible to get all that blood flow in and all the oxygen and the glucose and the nutrients that brain cells really want. Interestingly, our genes play a role. This is probably why some people need very little sleep and some people need a lot of sleep. When we uh, have a genetic efficiency in getting out this adenosine, we are able to sleep uh, very efficiently and we can clear it out in just you know five to six hour time. There's other people like me who really need a lot of sleep and are really more like a nine to 10 hour a night type person. Um, the only thing we know um, that is made by humans that changes this is caffeine, which is really interesting. So caffeine blocks this chemical from building up and helps us to feel more alert. I thought that was re really interesting. The term sleep disorder is an umbrella term that relates to about 100 different conditions that affect sleep quality, timing, duration, and the impact on a person's ability to function properly as they go throughout their day. In 1979, the American Sleep Disorders Association published the very first classification and we still abide by this to this day. Most sleep disorders can be characterized as having one or more of the following features. The first one is trouble falling or remaining asleep. Some people can go to sleep great, but they can't stay asleep. Other people um, have a very hard, long, hard time falling asleep, but once they're asleep, they're asleep. Uh, also, people can have difficulty staying awake during the day. That is the second characteristic of a sleep disorder. The third one is when people's sleeping and waking cycle gets all fouled up. We see this a lot of times in dementia and there's not that healthy rise of the melatonin and the fall of the cortisol. We should be sleeping when it's dark and awake when it's light. It's really pretty simple. And the fourth one is if you have any unusual behaviors that disrupts your sleep. So this can be like restless leg disorder, um, restless leg syndrome, pardon me, or REM sleep disorder where we act out our dreams. Like I said before, sleep apnea is the most common sleep disorder and there are two types of sleep apnea. Both disrupt the sleep through apneas or frequent arousals, which I'll describe in a minute, um, and falling oxygen levels. And when this happens, your sleep cycle, which is meant to be five continuous stages in and out seamlessly, gets all fragmented. When we awaken during a sleep cycle, we don't get to jump back in when we fall back asleep. We have to start all the way back at the starting point. So that can be very hard with sleep apnea because as I'll describe in a minute, you basically um, stop breathing and you jerk yourself awake and you're pulling yourself right out of whatever stage sleep you're in. You don't get to go back to stage four. You have to go back to the start and go back to stage one. So the two sleep apneas are uh, central and obstructive. Most of you who are listening to me probably have obstructive and I'm gonna explain the difference between them both. One similarity is that they both involve apneas. So what is an apnea? An apnea is a respiratory event that has to last 10 seconds or longer and this is either completely not breathing or when your airflow goes down by 30%. So when you don't breathe, that's called an apnea and when you breathe very shallowly, that's called a hypoapnea, okay? Um, there's symptoms of sleep apnea that include loud snoring, someone observing you stopping breathing, gasping or choking in your sleep or when you wake up, being very tired during the day, awakening with a dry mouth or a sore throat, waking up with a morning headache. This one is very important. So a sleep apnea headache is in the front part of your brain very tight and it goes away after about two hours. The reason that this happens is because there are high levels of carbon dioxide that get retained after an apnea or a hypoapnea. Basically the body goes into kind of cardiac shock with every single apnea and when the oxygen goes down more than 10-15% we get a burst of carbon dioxide and this buildup gives you pressure and pain in your head can also lead you to having a bad attention span when you're awake um, and a little bit of grumpiness and irritability. Think of the last time you had a terrible night's sleep. Are you really your best self that next day? I mean, in the, in the years where our two children were uh, infants, um, they're very close in age, um, I think I almost had a psychosis for those few years. It, they were both terrible sleepers, never napped, 
and my husband and I just used to walk around in a daze for years. Um, like I said before, there's two types of sleep apnea. So let's talk about the obstructive and then we're gonna talk about the central. With um, obstructive, we sometimes call that OSA and we know much more about obstructive than we do central. So about 10% of the world's population have obstructive sleep apnea, but check this out, up to 90% of people don't know it. That's why I thought this would be a bit of a public health service to talk about this because a the disorder happens when you're sleeping so if you live alone or you don't sleep with someone how are you ever going to know you have to go by the symptoms and kind of work backward um, and compliance with the CPAP the breathing machine is terrible so the number of people who have a sleep disorder especially OSA goes way 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 up when you start to talk to us in the brain health community so it's much higher than in the general population and mostly this is due to a neural disconnection in the nerves that control breathing from the brain to the respiratory center. So 60% of people with Parkinson's disease have sleep apnea. 60% of people with myasthenia gravis have sleep apnea. If you've had a stroke or a TIA, over 70% of you have sleep apnea. Is that not alarming or what? What are the risk factors for sleep apnea? Well, some of them are physical. Uh, a large neck. If your neck is over 17 inches for a man or 16 inches for a woman, you're at much higher risk. If you have a narrow throat, a large tongue, a small jaw, if you're a woman, um, pardon me, sorry, not if you're a woman. If you're a man, you're more than two to three times more likely to have it. Um, and that difference really seems pre-menopausal. Once us women get to the age of menopause, then the age risk kind of balances out. But typically the older you are, the more you're at risk. Heavy smokers are almost three times more likely to have obstructive sleep apnea than non-smokers. And for our folks out there with epilepsy, this applies to both children and adults. Um, epilepsy is a disorder characterized by two or more unprovoked seizures that happen within 24 hours. So just because you've had a seizure doesn't mean you necessarily have epilepsy, but up to 50% of people who have epilepsy and also a risk factor for um, OSA, which could be being a man, being a smoker, you know, the neck, the jaw, all that stuff. 50% of them met criteria for sleep apnea. That's pretty, pretty intense. Um, in uh, OSA, what we know is that it's, it's all about here. It's a narrowing of the upper airway, which completely collapses during the deep inhale and probably at the very, very end of the exhale. This continues until your brain gets a big old alarm system and basically jerks you out of sleep and the resulting increased tone and the stress on your uh, larynx and your throat muscles basically reopens the airway, but that's the gasp, right? So you get this alarm and all of a sudden, <gasps> and people you know, are awake. The only way you can diagnose sleep apnea is through a sleep study. A sleep study is a non-invasive overnight test where you're monitored while you either are in a sleep lab in someone's uh, office or you can actually do it at home. A lot of my patients are doing it at home now that we have COVID. Um, the whole idea is that an EEG monitors your sleep stages, especially looking at your deep sleep, like your REM. And they also look at things like your eye movements, your oxygen levels, you know, uh, your heart rate, the, the leg muscle movements. And the whole idea is to basically um, figure out, are you having any abnormalities when you're sleeping? Again, you're sleeping, you don't know, right? So with OSA, what they're really looking for are these apnea events. And they have something called an A. HI index, that's an apnea, hypoapnea index. And this is the number of respiratory events or apneas that a given patient has in an hour. And I want you to check this out because this blew my mind when I learned about this. So the way they classify it is mild sleep apnea is five to 14 apneas per hour, moderate is 15 to 29, and severe is over 30. Now, I have had patients with severe sleep apnea who have hundreds of apneas in an hour. But what blew me away about this is that this is trying to tell me that you can stop breathing four times in an hour at night and it's not a problem. I think that's a problem. Um, but I just wanna point that out because there's levels of sleep apnea and how severe it is dictates what you're gonna do about it. Um, so central sleep apnea, let's go over there. That's totally different. That happens because of a disconnect between the brain and the respiratory issue. 
obstructive sleep apnea is a problem with all of the uh, breathing apparatus that goes down into the respiratory issue. So this is really much more of a brain disorder. Um, and basically, uh, when there's problem in the brain stem, which controls breathing, we can often see that people have central sleep apnea. It's very common in heart failure, but if you also take opioid pain medications, you're at very high risk for this, and any of the brain centers that are involved with autonomic or involuntary breathing. Having obstructive sleep apnea is a risk factor for stroke, um, but it also dramatically can increase your blood pressure. Again, like I was saying before, this is tough on your cardiac system when you can't breathe, and especially, look what I just told you. Uh, you know, if you have, let's just say you have middle of the road sleep apnea and 25 times an hour you stop breathing, that's a lot of alarm systems, that's a lot of stress hormone, that's a lot of cortisol, that's a lot of cardiac pressure, okay? Sleep apnea of both kinds hurts your brain in five ways, and I wanna go over those with you. The first one is it causes you to move out of a deep sleep. The time where, especially with OSA, obstructive, we're the most relaxed, okay? So the, the respiratory center is its most relaxed, okay? So this is when we are going to have the biggest, uh, most uh, frequent apneas, right? This is gonna be in REM sleep. This is your deepest, deep cleaning stage of your sleep cycle. This can really mess up your ability to get that restorative sleep that you need and has a lot of physical, cognitive, and emotional side effects. Pretty, pretty, pretty bad. Number two is that when your sleep apnea is chronic, which most people have it for a relatively long period of time, this is where the brain damage comes in. The low amount of blood oxygen level, because you're not taking in as much air as you need, um, is, is not enough. Your brain needs more to function properly. And so repeated drops leads to white matter damage, okay? White matter, basically think of it like the connecting um, entities in your brain that help your brain cells connect quickly communicate rapidly. So lower blood oxygen levels are thought to be the most dangerous part of sleep apnea, and this is what can lead to the long-term damage. The third danger is it triggers the inflammatory response. Remember, your brain is interpreting not breathing as an emergency, which it is. And so it's very hard to not have a body that is stuck in fight or flight um, because the body constantly feels like there's something in the environment that's threatening to end its life. Number four is that there are huge consequences cognitively of having a tired brain. Um, not only are you much more at risk for blood pressure, diabetes, stroke, all that kind of stuff through the inflammation and the reduced immunity, but um, people make a lot more mistakes when they're tired. There's a lot more driving accidents. Drowsy driving presents as much of a safety risk as drunk driving. If you drive after 24 hours of not sleeping or after less than six hours of sleep, you are at a blood alcohol equivalent of 0.1%, which is higher than the legal limit in all the states. I thought that was a very important statistic to share with you. $31 billion a year in sleep deprivation work-related accidents. Um, adults who sleep less than five to six hours a night are at much higher risk for being uh, overweight. And the fifth, perhaps most compelling consequence of sleep apnea is death. A uh, uh, 2007 study from Yale Medical School taught us that when you have sleep apnea and it's not treated, you have a 30% uh, period of 30% uh, chance of dying in a period of four to five years than you did if you didn't have sleep apnea. 30% higher chance of dying. That's pretty pretty important to know. So if your sleep apnea is mild, you can maybe do some behavioral things. You can try to lose weight. You can avoid alcohol later into the night. Try to avoid sedatives for sleeping. We're going to talk about meds for sleep in a second. You can try nasal sprays. That's where those breathing strips can come in. And really the thing is you don't want to be sleep deprived even for one or two nights because the third night when you finally get good sleep, you're gonna be in such a deep sleep that you're actually gonna then have more sleep apneas and you're kind of creating this vicious cycle, okay? If you have moderate to severe sleep apnea, this is where the CPAP comes in, the most hated medical device uh, in, in my world, what I do. Continuous positive airway pressure. This was invented in 1981 by another Dr. Sullivan, an Australian, who basically reversed a vacuum cleaner where he blew air into the nasal passage and turns out he could stop sleep apnea that way. Um, it's considered to be the standard form of therapy for people with OSA. Um, if, and you know, people wear a mask and they receive pressurized air and it's through a connective hose and all this good stuff. For a very, very long time, we, 
insisted with patients that you had to use it at least six hours a night to have any benefit. Now, you do want to use it that long for full benefit, but it's very hard for a lot of people to use this apparatus. So A, I want to help you use it better, but also I want you to know that even if you can't use it at the full capacity, there's been recent research that suggests you will get some benefit. We used to tell people two, three years ago, it's not going to do anything for you if you can't make it to six hours, but that's really not true. Many people find the CPAP difficult um, and often don't use it as the doctor prescribed. Up to 80% of people are not compliant with their CPAP. Research tells us that patient education, imagine this, a good relationship with your doctor, um, a supportive partner or family, uh, an intensive follow-up program. These are the things that help people get with the CPAP. I want to tell you this because it's very important to me that you use it if you need to. Most people who ultimately become successful using CPAP have to go back for fittings, adjustments, humidifiers, pressure changes, 10 to 12 times. You are not being a pain in the neck if you keep calling the doctor to say, I'm really sorry, I just cannot use it. Whatever the roadblock is, whatever the barrier is, you just have to try, 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 try. It's not you, it's the nature of the beast and you have to be okay with doing that. So. The most common things that get in the way for people with CPAP, number one is claustrophobia. What I have found is if anyone um, has a history of trauma, um, especially our military folks uh, definitely have a hard time with feeling like something's on top of them, but it can go for any of us. Um, what the science tells us uh, is the best strategy to work with that is something called systematic desensitization and over time the idea is to just keep at it for shorter and shorter longer periods of time so one night you can only tolerate it a minute next night you try to get to two minutes by the end of the week we hope you're at five minutes and then over the course of a month you could be getting in a few hours it's it's you just can't avoid it you can't put it in the closet and pretend you don't have this problem because it's a really big deal Next one is uh, poor fit, air leaks around the mask. The nasal mask or the pillows have to be the correct size. Everyone has a different size nose, a different ratio from the nose to the mouth. You might have to try seven different kinds of masks or pillows. It has to be the right tightness. It can't be too tight. It's very customized, very personalized. Another problem that people have with not wearing the CPAP enough is they don't think it's really going to help. And that's a education myth that is my pleasure to try to dispel tonight. I'll do that in one second. The next one is dryness. Um, a lot of people um, benefit from a warm air humidifier that you can get to stick on the CPAP thing. That can, can really make a big difference. You can ask your supplier for that. People who don't like CPAP, who don't work well with it, can also try the BiPAP. So this is very similar, but it delivers pressure at a more variable rate. So for whatever reason, some people do better than that. So within two weeks of wearing this sucker, more than five hours a night, you should really start to see improvements. The first thing is you should not feel as grumpy and your spouse will be so happy for that. Um, you then should start to feel more clear headed, less headaches, like you can focus more. After three months, the research tells us that some of the gray matter damage that has happened in your brain from the decrease or the stopping of the oxygen goes away. And within 12 months of good use, six hours or more, in one study, all signs of brain damage were completely gone in the white matter. I mean, if that is not compelling, I don't know what is. I want you to use it during naps. There are many benefits to getting on board with it. You can reduce your risk of heart disease, stroke, diabetes, a car accident. Don't feel like crap because you're so tired. Be able to concentrate. Feel like you have more emotional stability. Don't bother your spouse because you're not snoring. Um, remember I said before, even the suboptimal adherence is good for you. So now they know even three to four hours, if that's all you can tolerate and you really give it a try, that's okay. It's better than not doing anything at all. Yes, we want you to be optimally adherent at six hours, but you just do your best, okay? Um, people who had seizures, who did have sleep apnea and went on the CPAP were able to reduce their seizure frequency by 45%. Very, very awesome. Before I mention, beware of treating your sleep problems with medication, and there's a couple that my brain health people need to know about. The first one are benzodiazepines. These are your Xanaxes, your Ativans. Now there is a time and a place for these medications, but every single night of sleep is not optimal. If you need to do it, I don't judge, 
but I do want you to know that there's some risk. So one of the risks is that you have a very high fall risk, up to four times more likely to fall and break your hip when you take Xanax every night. Some people think that's because when you get up to pee, people fall on the way and you could put up a little nightlight to help negate that. There are some significant side effects with daily use of Xanax. There's some evidence to suggest you're a little more likely to develop dementia. Um, using Ambien is not advised on a regular basis. Definitely creates confusion. You could be out on the streets naked swinging a golf club. You don't want that to happen to you. Um, but most important, what I want you to hear is this next uh, piece of advice because it's much more common for people to take um, antihistamines to go to sleep. And what I mean by that is Benadryl, Tylenol PM, Advil PM. They have a chemical in it. Um, that does the opposite of what the memory medicines on the market do today. And we call them anticholinergic effects. And it can really be the source. You can hurt yourself in two ways. They can actually make you sleep so much you wind up having more apneas, but in and of themselves, they can also hurt your brain chemistry and create some memory problems. You don't want that. So if after trying some of the more behavioral things, you still think you have a problem, or your spouse or a friend tells you you have a problem, then you need a sleep study. And you might have to advocate for this and insist on it because what I find in the brain health community, especially in stroke, um, people, oh my gosh, they are hardly ever asked about it despite the fact that 70% of them have sleep apnea. And I think it's something like only 10% of people who tell their doctor with a stroke that they're having snoring are offered a sleep study. So one theme in all of my I Care For Your Brain um, outreach that I do here on Facebook is you are gonna have to be your own advocate. You're gonna have to go in there and say, I really think I need a sleep study. And again, a lot of people are doing them at home now. So there's really no reason to set yourself up with it one night. You can learn a lot about what's going on with your sleeping, which is directly proportional to your brain health. So I hope that you guys feel like you learned something tonight. I really enjoyed refreshing my research on sleep apnea. I see it all the time in my patients. It's something, believe it or not, I actually really hope many times my patients have because it's so darn treatable. And it's not just a matter of, oh, all my problems are sleep apnea or they're not. Many times people that I know, my patients, have multiple layers to their cognitive issues or their fatigue. And if you haven't had a sleep study and you can't figure out why you're so tired or why can't I focus and why do I have headaches, get a sleep study. It's an easy way to find an answer, okay? So I also wanted to mention that tomorrow night at four o'clock, we are at the halfway point for our virtual stroke recovery group. It is going great. I have had such a nice time getting to know these folks and sharing the knowledge that I have about stroke recovery. It's really been an awesome time. So if you are um, in that community, please join us. You can go to our website at www.icfyb.com backslash SRG. I will do my best to be back here next Wednesday at six o'clock talking about something that I hope will help you. Um, if you thought that this was interesting or useful, I would be so grateful for you to share it on your page, especially any brain health community pages. That really helps us to get all of this good free information out to people. So thank you guys again for your attention and I really hope that you have a great week. Until I see you again, take care. Bye-bye.